Open your Bibles to the book of Genesis 32. This is a famous story in the Bible. Jacob wrestling the Lord. Probably one of the three things that Jacob's known about. You know, you have Jacob's ladder and Jacob's wrestling, this famous story. And then Jacob's well, John 4. <clears throat> that so Jacob is pretty famous about that, but we've been in a series on on marriage and family uh, out of the life of Joseph, uh, out of the life of Jacob, <clears throat> and so we're in a, a final look at that in his life. This is a real big issue in his life. There is a real, there was enough life change in him that God changed his name. And that's a big deal uh, because his name Jacob came from God and God changed that name. And when God changes a biblical name, it's a big deal. Uh, you know, he has to go back in the book of life and make a correction. I don't know. Let's see if you were paying attention. So uh, we're going from verse 24 through 32 thereabout. Uh, Jacob has left Haran and is headed back home with a new family and a new wealth. And <clears throat> he has stopped at the border and he's done several things that has been described in the first 21 verses. <clears throat> he has uh, made a, a, a peace negotiation. He's made a peace negotiation with Esau. He sent messages, and when when he and when he did that, he got his messenger brought brought back word that Esau was coming to meet him with four hundred men, and he panicked, <clears throat> and um, he went in and went into a pretty serious time of prayer with the Lord over it. We we, we all do when we get that kind of information, and then he selected a bunch of gifts to give his brother uh, hoping that that would work. He's divided his family into two groups. Put one on one side of uh, the, the, the river and then one on the other side. Uh, which is him alone and the gifts. Just in case they get to him, he's got the gifts. <clears throat> and all of that's really important, but in this whole process, uh, God is going to change his name, and I want you to pay attention to that because that's a big deal. And there were things that God saw in Jacob that he probably didn't see even himself but God was evaluating him on spiritual growth maturity, not on human stuff, on divine stuff. <clears throat> and he gives him a new name for a new start. And so here we go. <clears throat> so he's left alone uh, and a man, that's his view, at the beginning of his wrestling, wrestled with him until daybreak. That's about the longest wrestling match you would ever find probably recorded in human history. And when he saw that he had not prevailed against him, he touched the socket of his thigh. <clears throat> That's Jacob's thigh. That's the man he was wrestling with. That touched his thigh, knocked his hip out of joint so that the socket of Jacob's hip was dislocated while he was wrestling with him. <clears throat> I'll tell you what impressed God about this, that he didn't quit. Now, that's pretty, that's pretty serious. When you fall and break your hip, you're still wrestling. I mean, every coach would like, every, every wrestling coach would like to have him on the team, wouldn't he? Especially if he wrestled to win. And in the end, he did, which is pretty good. Then he said, let me go, for the dawn is breaking. But he said, I will not let you go until you bless me. The man he was wrathing said, said, why don't you give up and call it a day? And he said, not unless you bless me. So he said to them, what is your name? And he said, my name's Jacob. He said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, 
for you have you have striven with God and with men you have prevailed. That's how he changed. That's why he changed his name. Jacob asked him and said, please tell me your name. And he said, why is it that you ask my name? And then he blessed him there. So Jacob named the place Peniel, for he said, I, and this is what it means. I have seen God. What did he start wrestling with? In, in his view, he is wrestling with what? A man. But in the end, he knew that he was wrestling with God. This is not a dream. This is not a vision. This is not a trance. This is literal. So, you can't wrestle with God, right? God is spirit, and those who worship him who worship him in spirit and truth. You can't wrestle with God. So, he's wrestling that represents God, the pre-incarnate Christ. He's the visible manifestation of God, is he not? And Jacob was absolutely convinced at the end of the wrestling match that he'd wrestle God. All right. Now the sun rose upon him just as he crossed over Penuel, and he was limping on, on his thigh. Therefore, to this day, <clears throat> this is why it's literal. We're, now, we're in Moses' day, and it was true throughout the history of Israel. This verse is true throughout the history of Israel, <clears throat> that to this day, the sons of Israel do not eat the sinew of the hip, which is on the socket of the thigh, because he touched the socket of the of Jacob's thigh in the sinew of the hip. There it is. It's a literal as uh, so a match. But what a powerful deal this was. <clears throat> was this figurative? Was he was he so distressed distressed that he wrestled God about the decision he'd made? No, he actually wrestled God. Was he distressed over his deal? Yes, he was. Had he previously before the wrestling match? Had he previously prayed? Yeah, yeah. If you read, uh, if you read through uh, like eight through eleven, yes, he did. <laughs> I mean, he entered this match, prayed up, ready to go. And it's just kind of interesting. Let's have a word of prayer and we'll study it. See what what this passage is all about. How it applies to your life. <laughs> Give you a moment of silence as a believer priest and dwelt by the Holy Spirit the privilege to confess your sins. The Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. It can't be studied in the flesh. It can't be studied by carnal believers and getting more than unbelievers because the Holy Spirit is the great teacher of the Word of God. He, he's, he sinks it into your soul and He brings it out. He is the champion of, for those who study the Word of God for inhale, exhale. How do I know if I'm carnal? Evidence of personal sin, both by conscience and by conviction. What do I do with it? I confess it, 1 John 1, 9. If I confess my sin, he's faithful and just to forgive me and cleanse me. What does that do? It puts me back into the spiritual ministry of the Holy Spirit, teaching me the truth of the Word of God tonight. It's essential for, for inhale. It's essential. It's, a, it's necessary for exhale, the application. So be sure. Mental attitude, sin, sins of the tongue, and overt sins should be confessed in silence and privacy prior to study. I require this not only of people who attend us, but those who are setting in by the Internet. It's required of you. It's classroom etiquette. And you're, you're to be in a place and a, a volitional choice not to be disturbed for this next hour. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the truth that comes through the Word of God and we thank you for the privilege and the freedom we have to study it without censorship. We know there are a lot of people in the world that don't have a Bible, don't have the privilege of, they, they're censored and they have to study it in the most unusual ways and places. But we live in a nation of freedom yet and we, we, we thank you for it. It's not because we have good government officials. We know we don't, that's not true. <clears throat> but it's because of your grace. It's because the church is still alive and well. It's because people are, men are still out there teaching the word of God. Believers are out there as, as mature believers teaching the word of God to people who need to hear it. And for that, Father, we thank, we thank you that we're part of that team of spiritual mature believers that take responsibility for what we learn, not only for our personal life, 
but for others that are struggling like Jacob was. So tonight, Father, help us understand the truth of what's behind this Jacob wrestling, this wrestling match that turned in his favor and that God would change his name and put his feet on a new path. When he goes back home, when he left, he wasn't much of an heir. He's kind of like the prodigal son. But when he returned, he was new like the prodigal son was new. His life had been dramatically changed by the grace and love and mercy of God. And so, Father, we pray we'd see that and understand that in our journey, for we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Now, you really need in your time, go back and study the whole chapter because the first 21 verses has, has set the stage for this wrestling match and the outcome of it. So that, that's going to be important. Because I have a grandson that wrestles, um, I'm always telling him that he picked the oldest sport in the world. Wrestling is the oldest recorded sport in the world. It, we know it goes back to 3000 BC um, at an earlier date than where we are here in our study. It goes back 3000 years BC. The Egyptians and the Babylonians both had this sport. But probably nobody wrestled like this one. Uh, this boy just wouldn't give up. And uh, he probably would give up quicker if it had dawned on him he was wrestling God. Right? But he didn't know that. And uh, and I, I got to tell you, there's no evidence that this was done by a dream or a trance. God always tells you when it's a dream, a trance, or a vision. He doesn't hide it from you. And we know that the people of Israel believed it was a true story. You know how? Remember how this ended? I mean, it's part of history. I mean, they believe this. I mean, <clears throat> so Jacob began wrestling with what appeared to him as a man. This is recorded in Hosea, the 12th chapter, verse 4, that says that he was wrestling an angel. That he, I mean, they knew it wasn't that. And what it was was pre-incarnate Christ. They were, they were closer to it. But he thought he was actually wrestling a man. It refers to him, uh, but Hosea refers to as, as wrestling an angel which would be understanding in the pre-incarnate person of Christ. Towards the end of this wrestling match, Jacob was aware that it was God or the pre-incarnate Christ. In Genesis 32, 28 through 30, uh, this, this becomes part of biblical, part of Israel's history, right? I mean, he writes it. As, listen, how he does this, how he writes it. Therefore, to this day, Moses is writing this. So, um, John, I, I wrote some key verses down out of the Gospel of John, John 1, 18, 6, uh, 46, and the 12th chapter 45, I bold printed it for you, Late, go, read all of them, but pay attention to 12, 45, Jesus, and then Colossians 1, 5, Jesus is always the, the visual manifestation of God. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father business. I mean, if you saw God, you didn't live. But look, and they knew this. Listen to this. Listen to what Jacob said. Um, Jacob, in verse 28, Jacob, God says, um, uh, uh, well, J Jacob, oh, it, down in verse 30, Jacob named the place and then said, I have seen God face to face, and yet my life has been preserved. You can't see God face to face, but you can't, you can Jesus Christ. Okay. And so that's, that's kind of important. The other thing that's important in this is God changed his name. And biblical names are part of the plan of God. They, they tell a story, a biblical, the Hebrew names tell a story all of their own. For example, the name Jacob. When you read the 25th chapter, verse 26, at the birth, remember there were twins? You know why you got the name Jacob? What, what, yeah, what, what did he do, Don? 
Yeah, yeah, right? And that's why he's called Jacob. Now, every, and that's what ja the word Jacob means. But everybody says, well, it means deceit or supplanter or whatever. That's because the, the two guys, the two babies unborn were prophetically fighting each other. Remember that? Prophetically. And, uh, and so because of that and because of Jacob's character, early character, before he got renamed, his early character was a deceiver because of the way he treated his brother and his dad and all that business, right? He got a bad reputation for a name, but his the name Jacob actually means holding on to the heel. So you always pay attention when you have a biblical name of somebody, you go to go back to the scripture where he was named and find out what the name means, right? Okay. So God's going to change his name uh, to Israel. And what does that mean? He tells you in the scripture, it means that he prevailed with God. It means he prevailed with God. And then he names the place after it. The place where the match took place is renamed. I wrestled with God face to face and prevailed. But there's a story in itself, isn't it? We won on points, I guess, right? <laughs> He didn't pin him, and God didn't hit. But apparently, he won on points. If you know anything about wrestling, it's just an interesting story in so many realms. Uh, this is one of my favorite stories to tell my grandson who wrestles. This is the one I love. Man, you never give up. Wrestling is not one of those sports that you're, you're all alone. He was all alone, and that's how you wrestle. You're all alone. There's no team effort in that. Uh, coaches can't even much do for you anything for you except throw a towel in, I guess. I have seen him do that. And, and I'll tell you, wrestlers are a breed in themselves. I have a cousin that wrestled at the University of Michigan, went on and placed third in the Olympics and uh, won a medal. They're a unique breed of guys if they last it. If, they go, if, you, go, if you last through high school wrestling, you're, you're a unique breed of kid. And the things that, th that that sport develops in a person is unbelievable. I've never met one that just didn't have inner character. And uh, smart football coaches, they like wrestlers because they, they become the real, the real guts on defense. They'll all put them on someplace on the defense, and most of them wind up, wind up uh, linebackers. <laughs> they wind up linebackers. They're just mean as a hornet, and they never quit. They just never quit. They've learned that. But, but anyhow, I mean, it's, you know, I don't want to get off my subject. But he prevailed. And so his name, his name, the, the word Israel, it calls him Israel, means that he, that he never quits. He, he prevailed. He even prevailed with God. Apparently won on points. You get, well, at, least, at least God felt that way. Then he gave him points. I mean, that's a pretty big point. I mean, you couldn't get bigger than that. Gave you name change. And God expects, listen, and you know what? God expects him to live up to his name. Stop grabbing, now stop being a heel and start. <laughs> start being a prevailer. Start being a victor. Start being a victor. That's what he's talking about. Um, after 20 years in Haran, Jacob was returning home with a new family and new wealth. As he neared his homeland, he stopped to camp to devise a plan, if you read first 21 verses, to devise a plan to deal with the raft of Esau. The, when he left home, Esau says, I'm going to kill him. But here's the part of the story. It's really important. So I want you to go to chapter 32 and look at verse 1 and 2 because this is so important to this story. Then J Jacob's gone through this this. Uh, he, he's at this place, thir, find or find 32, 32. Now, as Jacob went on his way, the angels of God met him. And Jacob said, when he saw them, this is God's camp. So the name, he, he names the name, watch this now, ha, uh, Mahanayim, Mahanayim. Mahanayim is really important. Now, what you have is you have two angels. You have two angels that appear to him. 
You have two angels who appear to him. And, and he names them by what the experience he had with them. And what this name means is they represented two military groups. This is military. This is a military word. For grouping, military grouping. And this is really important. They said to him, this is God's camp. Look at verse 2. This is God's camp. And so he named, in other words, they said this is God's camp. And, and he used that as military term. And so Jacob named the place two companies, two camps or two companies representing two military escort groups. Okay, and, and that's really important in the story. It's going to go on, and a little bit later, he's going to go into prayer, and God's going to talk to him through his prayer and, and tell him some things that's really important. Okay, but I'm just trying to tell you some things here that, that's, that's already been stated that's important to this story. Now, these two angels could very well have been, for example, the two who were sent to Abraham and Lot, to destroy Sodom. That's who they were. In Genesis 19, 1, and then verses 11 through 24. It is interesting to me as a student that at Gethsemane, in the Garden of Gethsemane, when they came to arrest Jesus, Peter pulls his sword, right? Jesus tells him, put it up. Then he tells him this. He says that he has authority to dispatch 12 legions of angels. That's military. We're talking military again. He said, listen, I have the authority. Put your sword up. One sword. <clears throat> One sword. Listen, you've missed who I am, buddy. Put your sword. You, missed, you have missed who I am. Don't you understand that I, the Son of God, have the authority to dispatch 12. You're talking about, you're talking about Armageddon. And Gog and Magog type of war sends two in to take, so take the valley of Sodom and Gomorrah. <clears throat> two, two, mili two military uh, reconnaissance guys. It goes in there and tells them where to drop everything, right? They walk in there and, and God drops everything he's got up there on them and, the, and it's all over. Do you not know? Now listen to me. Let's, let's bring this down to where we sat. Do you not know that that Jesus Christ sits on the throne in absolute authority over our world, our state, our nation, our church, and your life? Do you not know that's, a, that's the guy? I mean, he's the man. He is the man. So you have the privilege, according to Hebrews 4.16, you have the privilege to go to his throne anytime, privileged position, and seek everything you need that's compatible with the God, compatible with the will of God you can get. Do you not know that? And why do you struggle with all this foolishness in your life? Why do you struggle with all this foolishness? Well, I can't do this, and I can't do that, and I, what are this? Why do you go there? Why do you go through all that and get yourself all stirred up and in a mess? You got the man's right there. Why don't you go to him? You got access to the guy. He was. Well, anyhow. You might ask, like me, you might ask, why Jacob and why now? I'll tell you why. The bottom line, you know, here's the bottom line. Jacob is the heir, the patriarch heir of the Messianic seed, of the Abrahamic covenant. He is heir of the Abrahamic covenant, which is the land, the seed, and the blessings, right? 
He's the guy. And he's been on furlough. You know what I mean? He's been AWOL, not furlough. He's been AWOL. For 20 years, the guy's been AWOL. And he's made a right decision in the directive will of God. He's made a right decision to go back and take ownership. Take responsibility. There's some re- I, want you back, I want you back in your rightful position, but it's going to take some responsibility to get there. I want you to understand that. And listen, it's starting to dawn on him as, as, of all what this is. Well, let's go home. Now we're about to get home. And then you go like, oh, wait. <laughs> wait. Wait. <laughs> Huh. And then he sends he sends messengers out, and they come back and said, "Yep, he's coming with four hundred men." He panics and then goes to prayer. God bless him. That was a smart move. He panicked and then went to prayer, and he tells God, "I'm in a state of mind. I'm in panic." That's an interesting prayer. Get, Listen, he lets you slide in on some of your prayers. Said, I've prayed that prayer before in my life. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> it's just interesting. I'm just telling you, it's really interesting. But I'm, at, I'm more interested in this wrestling match. Point number one, four points. Number one, this wrestling match did not occur as a dream, a trance, or a vision. According to the scriptures, it was literal, 32, uh, 24 we know it's literal because of what verse 32 says, right? Right? It became part of the history books. In this wrestling match, Jacob was injured. Somewhere in the middle of this wrestling match, in the middle of the, this, somewhere, uh, God lifted him up and slammed him down, right? Somehow or another, I mean, he whacked him pretty good. Let me tell you, as a wrestler, when your hips out of joint, not only are you a lot of plane, but you're not very mobile. Your legs are everything, right? Mm-hmm. And when one's out, I mean, somebody better be throwing the flag in. But there was nobody to throw it because he was alone. And he's wrestling God, who doesn't really care about a flag. But I love this. He didn't quit. I guess his attitude was, well, you'll have to kill me because I ain't quitting, which is a wonderful attitude and probably should do what he did. If you ever get in that shape and you go that far, you should probably give up wrestling, right? (laughs) Because you're probably not a good candidate because you wrestle when good sense says you should quit. But I ain't going to quit. Just go ahead and kill me. So that, in my opinion, would be a good time. As far as I know, he never wrestled again. He wouldn't have qualified because he limped too much, I guess. <laughs> so who would want him on his team? Probably most of us because he had the he had the attitude, didn't he? Well, anyhow, he got injured in verse 25. The injury became famous in Israel his, history in verse 32. And that's important. Why did Jacob think he needed to face the big problem alone? That's, that's, that's an interesting question, isn't it? Because the Bible makes a big point, all alone. Well, we're told that when he got this message back in verses 3 through 8, when he got this message back from his uh, uh, embassy, uh, ambassadors that went out and came back, the Bible says fear and distress overcame him. You know what they destroy in your life. Now, listen to me. This is important because this is in the Bible for you and me, not for Jacob because he's done. He's had his match and he's over. We're in our match and it's not over. So when you get that whatever it is, I don't care what it is, but when you get that big message that puts fear and distress in your life, you know, when you allow that, that's a choice. You allow that. Me. You can't do anything about the message that came to your life, but you can do something about how you interpret it, right? You know what it just destroyed in his life that's going to be necessary? Faith. It's going to destroy faith. Fear fear destroys faith. You know why? Because you're walking by sight, not by faith. You're walking by sight. Let me tell you something else about this. 
because I know the end of the story like you do. That was all based on a false assumption. Something that happened 20 years ago. He thought his brother had never changed, although he had. He didn't think his brother would change. And he would kill him. Which is an impossibility because God owns your life. Nobody can kill you. You understand that? You could die. And you could die at somebody else's hands. Paul did. Jesus did. But you can't die outside of the will of God according to that. You understand what I mean? We're all going to die from something. Whatever you die from, be a hero with it. Right? Be a hero. By that, I don't mean a hero in the human sense. I mean a hero of the faith. <laughs> die with your boots on, with your head, your head held high, uh, because that's where you're going. You're going to the high place. You're not going to the low place. <clears throat> so, so, when he, when great fear grips him and he gets into stress of his soul, <clears throat> he's just shut down the faith, re the, the whole faith system, the faith cycle system and the faith, re it's boom, it's gone, right? But he's got to work his way back into getting that fear out and getting the faith is before the match is over, he's back to faith. When God took his hip out, he went, I'm not quitting. I'm not quitting. I don't care. Just go ahead and kill me. I'm not quitting. And then when the other person says, well, look, it's about time to quit this foolishness. He went, then you better bless me because I'm innocent. So you, you, you're thrown in the towel. Listen, Jacob says with a hip out of joint, you're thrown in the towel. Because I ain't. I love that attitude. So did God. Because he went from fear to faith. That's what he did. And God went, cha-ching. I've waited 20 years for this, son. I've waited 20 years for this. I've waited 20 years for this. And we're going to make this a big event in your life. This is going to be like you've been saved all over again. You know what I mean? Not literally, but figuratively. Probably the two angels that came and said the, that we got to have two camps is what stuck in his head when he devised a plan to put, a, put his party in two parts. But his motive was, you remember what his motive was? To put the camp in two different places? Well, they, listen, if he, if he attacks one, then the other may be able to escape, right? That's what he says. Maybe one will survive. I'll take myself over here with the gifts and then... Put the family out front. No, I don't. I, <laughs> well, what did God promise him? Military escort. He said, "I'm going to pick you up right here, and I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to put a military escort in you all the way in." But see, what took that pro what took that promise away from him was fear, doubt, and all that gobbledygook in his soul, right? Took all that out. I mean, he had been prepped wonderfully by the Lord. <clears throat> been prepped wonderfully by the Lord for that. <clears throat> At the end, he'll come back to that idea. But in the beginning, well, where did he get the idea of two camps? It was apparently from that interview with the two angels. Well, what got him was Esau's message. When they came back with Esau. Esau's headed your way with 400 Fighting men. Well, he should have said, boy, they're in trouble. If he had believed the prophetic message from God, then he would have said, boy, are they in trouble? <clears throat> boy, are they in trouble? And why, why two sets of angels when he divided him? He should have said, God's got them both covered, right? But you see, that's the way faith would think. But that's not the way fear thinks. I hope you're listening. Oh, I hope you're getting this. These two angels represented two encampments to Jacob, which became part of Jacob's plan. You can read about it in verses 7, 8, and 22. But 
The truth of the matter, to Jacob, what did they represent in the plan of God? Divine protection over, over both groups. Divine protection. A military escort take them into the land. Listen, nothing can get you. Nothing can touch you without permission from God. And when he gives it, he's got everything on your side for you to, to win. There's no place in your life for fear and doubt and all that anxiety and stress. You li that, you're living in a what if. Well, what if I don't pass? And what if I don't do it? And what if I don't? And you sit around and you talk about false assumptions. What if is a false assumption. What if? What if will drive you nuts. Here's the here's second point. After devising a plan, Jacob prays regarding the fear and the stress about facing Esau. This is recorded in verses 9 through 12. So he sent gifts ahead in a peace negotiation with Esau. Not a bad idea. That's all right. Nothing wrong with that. And that's recorded in 13 through about 21 or 23 in the furthest part of it. I love his prayer. His prayer is so normal Christian. It is so like us. I want, to, I want you to pay attention to it in these verses. He starts out, he is aware, he, he mentions in verse 9, he, he mentions that he is aware of the directive will of God. Look at verse 9. Let me get back to 32. I'm skipping over 32. I'm in verse 9. Jacob said, O oh God, my father Abraham, God of my father Isaac, O Isaac, oh Lord, who does say to me, Return, here's the directive will of God that he's repeating. Return to your country and to your relatives, and I will prosper. All right? So he, he, listen, God wants to hear that. God wants to know that you're on the same page. So he states back that why he's, he states back why he's coming back. I am returning. I am returning. The Lord said, return to your country and to your relatives. So I'm obeying. It with me. All right. Look at verse 10. In verse 10, and I wrote this on your paper for you. In verse 10, he gives, he, he gives a thanksgiving, just like we should do. Now, you say, well, he's probably priming the pump. I don't care. God likes thanksgiving. Now, he decides whether you're priming the pump or not. All right? It's not up to you. I am unworthy of all the loving kindness and all of the faithfulness of which you have shown to me, your servant. And for my staff, only I crossed with Jordan, and now I've become two companies. Look at number, verse 11, his petition. Now, here's where it gets interesting, his petition. Here's what he prays. This is personal. Deliver me, I pray, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him, lest he come and attack the mothers with the children. For thou didst say, I will surely prosper. Now, look, that's one of those, that's one of those, that's one of these really important parts like in Genesis 2.17 when he says, don't eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. The day, the day you eat, dying you will die. That's one of these. This is one of these deals here. And he uses a, a cal infinitive with a cal imperfect on the same word of prosper or do good. He doubles that, which means that's an absolute. This, this is, at, now I can't tell you how important that is. He says, deliver me, I pray for the hand of my brother, for I fear, least he come and attack me. Uh, verse 12, for thou didst say, I will surely prosper you and make your descendants as the sand of the sea, which cannot be numbered for multitudes. You know where that comes from? The Abrahamic covenant. That's the Abrahamic covenant. Do you know where that was stated to him? When he went in, when he stopped at Bethel on his way into Haran, and we have Jacob's ladder, he goes over the Abrahamic covenant with him and tells him that exact thing. I think I listed it, the prophetic will in uh, Genesis 27, 14. He says to him in, in the story of Jacob's ladder, 
Your descendants will also be like the dust of the earth. You will spread out to the west, the east, the north, and the south. And in you and in your descendants, all the family of the earth will be blessed. He's talking about Christ. And then in that, in, at Bethel, in 2815, he, he gave him the directive will. Behold, listen to this. He says to him, this is before, this is 20 years earlier. He said to him, behold, I am with you. I am with you. And I will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Now he's meeting him 20 years later with the same discussion as he is approaching the land, which he has been faithful to bring him to. And he is not about, he is not about to let him fail at this point. You understand what I mean? But it is volitional. How long we sit and, how long we sit and stew is volitional. Okay, so all this is starting to fit together. Are you with me? All right. So remember that in this prayer, we have a restatement of the directive will of God. We have him giving thanks. We have him making a petition and then, a, then awareness of the divine promise. For you said, I will surely prosper you, yada, yada. Are you with me? That's a big deal. And he's moving, and he's moving. Listen, he told the Lord, listen, I, I'm a ball of nerves right now. I know I shouldn't be, but I am. All right? Now he's going to get this message, and, uh, he's, you know, as the day goes on and the cloud of dust, he begins to see a cloud of dust. He, he is crazy. Point number three. Since Jacob knows all of this doctrinally, right? Come on now. Since he knows all this doctrinally, why is he filled with fear and distress and panic as a state of mind? Why is Jacob making the mountain out of a molehill? Because he certainly is doing that. Because Jacob is walking by sight and not by faith. He's walking by fear. 2 Corinthians 5, 7. You see, the mental attitude sin of fear has shut down the faith cycle. In the parable of the sower in Matthew 13, as it explained in 1 and 9, and, and then interpreted in uh, verses 18 through 23, I'm speaking out of verse 22, Jesus warned about the thorny ground. Remember, remember the four grounds? They were the four hearers of the word of truth. He talks about the thorny ground hearer. And he is the one on whom the seed was sown among the thorns. This is the man who hears the word and the worries of the world and the deceitfulness of wealth choke out the word and becomes fruitless or unfruitful. See, that's what happens with mental attitude sins, like fear, doubt. It shuts down faith. What, I mean, what you should say is, what's the Bible say? What does the Bible say? Then hang your hat on it. Hang your faith on what the Bible says. The rest of his gobbledygook of the world. The rest of his gobbledygook. I don't know what gobbledygook is, but it's the worst thing I could think of. The content of Jacob's emergency prayer is lost to faith, to, to faith uh, by fear. It, the, the, it, the loss of faith is because of fear. The fear and panic... In a spiritual mature believer is Jacob's situation. You ought to pay attention to your life. There's a Bible verse you should put someplace in the back of your Bible. And when you get in this state of mind, you ought to go to 2 Corinthians, the 10th chapter, 4 through 6. So let's just drop over there and take a look at that. Because I think it's one of those passages that are really important for your life when you get in that state. Here's what he says. Now, he says what we call walking by sight, he calls walking by flesh. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare, see, he talks about warfare. And he said, here's our weapons. The weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. Now, pay attention to where these are. Because they're inside you. 
These are things that you have built in your life that are going to distract you under emergency times, in panic times, things that have that you consider to be bigger than life itself. These fortresses is what you're going to lean on rather than faith. Divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses, for we are destroying speculations. That's the false assumptions that lead to false interpretation, that leads to false expectation, that leads to false application. That's true in his life, it's true in your life, it's true in my life, it's true in everybody's life. Destroying speculations that come out of these fortresses, speculations, every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. Where does that come from? These fortresses build up in your own head from the world. Well, I have every right to be mad. I have every right to, that, all that justification. What's the Bible say? What's the Bible say? Go by that. And we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. For we are, for we are ready to punish all disobedience wherever your obedience is complete so that your obedience can be complete. You see, that's what, that's what Paul talks about in Romans 12 too. That's what Paul talks about in Ephesians 4, 20, 20 through about the, 24. Where did you get this ideas that could stand in opposition to the revealed will of God that you know is the revealed will of God and yet at, at some point in your life you throw that aside and go into some kind of craziness other people say you get a hold of yourself what is happening to you ever heard that what they're trying to do is to pull you back to a place of faith you have fallen off the track this is what he's talking about in 2 Corinthians 10. Tear down those fortresses. Put off that old man. That's what he's talking about. You can tell when you're there because you're a basket case, we say. You're in panic. What's going to happen? What's going to happen? Who cares? Well, you don't understand. I have everything hanging on it. What are you talking about? What's, what's the Bible say? I don't know. I don't have time to read the Bible. I'm too worried. I got enough to do right here. I'm, I'm crying and I'm worried and I'm upset. Don't you, can't you tell me? Can't you see, Ron, that I'm upset? Yeah, but I don't know why. Well, if you, you just. What's the Bible say? I don't care what the Bible says. I don't know. Here we are. Get out of your fortress. You got, in, you got into a bad one. I don't know. You're listening to me. Yeah. Hebrews 11, chapter verse 6. Listen to this. And, and Jacob is a, a classic case of how God does like it when he sees it. It says, and without faith, it's impossible. There's our word. We talked about this word impossible last night. It's impossible to please God. Without what? It's a, without what? <laughs> it's impossible to please God. So when God sees faith, what does it do? It pleases him. And when it pleases him, listen, when, when you, you know, when mama's happy, everybody's happy kind of thing. Well, when daddy's happy, everybody's happy. Without faith, it's impossible to please God for he who, listen to this. Now listen to this because you, you, listen, this is about people who forget this. I say, it's impossible, please God. But here's the key. Here's what you've forgotten about. This is a big promise. Is that not a great promise? Faith pleases God. That's the positive side. Listen to what he says. This is what people miss about that. For he who comes to God, for he who comes to God must believe that God is. That God is. And he is always is. I is and I always is. Nothing changes God. A lot changes you, but nothing changes him. He's what? 
immutable. We just studied it. He who comes to God must believe that he is God Almighty and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. Now, somewhere in that match with Jacob, that thing flipped in his head. So he wasn't about, he's going to seek that thing. He's not going to quit. He's not going to give up. And he pleases God by his faith. And what did God do? What did God say he would do? When he's pleased by your faith, what does he do? He rewards you. He gives me a nice little bowl of ice cream. Or apple pie or banana pudding. Or <laughs> Let's go down the list. <laughs> Listen, without faith it's possible to please God, but here's how you can please Him. Put your faith on the line. Put it on the line. Put it on the line. Never give it up for anything. Don't give it up for doubt, fear, none of that craziness. Hang in there because here's what He'll do. He'll show you that he is God Almighty. He is the fixer. He is the fixer. And when you please him, he rewards you. And I'm going to tell you, he gives good stuff out. None of this phony baloney stuff. None of this stuff that wears out in two minutes. Huh? When he rewards you, listen, when he rewards you in time, you will see that reward in eternity. Right? 1 Corinthians 3. Isn't God good? Why do, we, why do we not wrestle no matter what's going on? Oh, my hip hurts. I can't wrestle. Suck it up, boy. Let me see what you got. And boy, I think it flipped. Now, God didn't say that to him. He just kept wrestling. But listen, in his head, he flipped, didn't he? I mean, you get a, you get a broken hip or a hip knocked out of joint. I just can't, I can't imagine. Deanna, what toe was that, Al? Her second toe on her, she bumped something and it got knocked out of joint. She said, we're all there. She says, Daddy, come and, come and pull this back and put it in place. See, they think I can do all that because I was, that's what I, I was in the military, but I didn't deal with toes. <laughs> that's what I did in the military. Well, I pull it, and she goes, oh, ooh. And I go like, I, I can't do that. I can't do that. We, we need to take you to somebody. I don't know. I, I don't know what I'm doing. I mean, I, I, mean, I, I saw guys do it in football. They, they, people would do this all the time, and they'd go like, oh, and they'd go like, and they'd be all right. I don't know. I couldn't do it. She says, oh, I need somebody to pull my dog. Elle said, I'll do it. <laughs> Elle said, I, I can do this. And we were all willing to let him do it, and so was Deanna. And Al Swanee, he pulled that thing out and put it back in there. Thank you, Al. The rest of us, we were headed to the emergency room because I couldn't go through that moment of pain. I was pulling a little bit here, oh, a little more, oh. And I went, I'm done. <laughs> Al went, quit. Give, it, give me that toe. <clears throat> and we were all thankful for that because the rest of us, I couldn't find, I was in the Bible trying to find toe. <laughs> What's the Bible say about toe? You know, <laughs> I couldn't find toe. I was done. <laughs> uh, to, to, oh, I should have said toe. There you are, big guy. Well, Al had it, and so we're thankful for that. He, he was... He's, he rescued us. Point number four. Uh, I went from a hip out of the joint to a toe. <laughs> uh, you can see how what kind of craziness we have when we go on trips and stuff, don't you? <clears throat> I imagine. I don't know. Uh, th my final point. This shows Jacob had, listen, what this shows is Jacob had unresolved old man uh, Cosmos baggage. He had what we call baggage. We call it old man cosmos. He had baggage. He had baggage. He had baggage about the certain certain ways he's going to live his life and certain ways he would allow God to live it. 
I, I, you know, I, I've got my own things to do. I'm going to do it my way. And then when it doesn't work, then I'll come over and do it your way. That stuff don't work. I guess you know that by now. If you don't, why? You need to start wrestling. In fact, this baggage is 20 years old. That's not uncommon, by the way. Can I tell you that? This is not uncommon at all. It has been brought back to surface by his returning home. Something brought it back up, see? It lay dormant for a while, then it's back up because it's on the front burner. When it gets on the front burner, then we're back into our uh, little fortress conflict. Now it is time to deal with it. He has made good choices externally. He's offered peace, prayer, presence. But see, his problem is internally. <laughs> and so he, God puts him in a wrestling and uh, puts, puts a lot of squeeze on him, doesn't he? So false assumptions, the what ifs in our life, rather than what the Bible says, led him to false interpretation, false expectation, and false application. So at some point, he's got to bite the bullet and take care of this stuff. He is honest about his fear, but not about his faith. Isn't that, isn't that interesting? That's how you know he's got a problem. Oh, he's dead on about fear. I mean, he tells God, look, at I'm full of it. And uh, God says, yeah. Y'all need to, listen, I'm, inter I'm not interested in fear. I'm interested in your faith. If I can see your faith, we, we, beat, we beat fear. You beat, faith beats fear every time. The reason it comes back is you got baggage in it. You got, you got some false premises in your mind, some fortresses of speculation of how things should go. And if they don't, I'm upset. He is honest about fear, but not about his faith. He is focused on his inadequacies, but not on God's adequacies. Do you get the difference? Yeah. Oh, please. Yeah, sure. It uh, sounds good. You know, I say, you know, this, this here is good and wears hard. He has chosen the grasshopper mentality. You know, the grasshopper is the victim mentality. Remember when the spies went into the land? They all come back and said, oh, they're giants, but we're grasshoppers. What's the Bible say? Bible call you a grasshopper? You want to be called grasshopper? I don't think so. Well, let's see. God got man out of a grasshopper. Oh, yeah. I reached out and found a grasshopper one day. I said, this would be good. So I made some basketball players and some football players. I just made them all out of grasshoppers. Huh. How about that? Yeah. We're like grasshoppers. Now, compared to somebody who's eight foot tall, imagine what a grasshopper is. Well, we would really have to get measuring out there. I don't know if I have a measure that could go that down, probably. I don't know. I'd be down there with my little finger trying to measure it. Yeah. You can read about this in Numbers 13. You know what that is? That's fear. And, and wh why did they attach themselves to that? That's his, this, this has stuff they've built into their head. That says, this is who you are. Grasshopper. You know, in psychology, they have a, a they, 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 they deal with that kind of a symptom. I don't know if they do it anymore. Probably not because it's in the Bible. Grasshopper. You know what a grasshopper approach is? A victim. It's a victim mentality. Caleb had the victor. Caleb and Joshua said, so what? Go in there. God is big. Nobody's bigger than God. You know, love that. Nobody's bigger than God. Go in there and whack them. All God wants is somebody to represent, his, re represent him by faith. That's, nothing has changed in this world about that. So they take a, all the 10 spies take a victim mentality and two take a victor's mentality. A victor mentality comes out of a faith-based thinking. The divine solution to the old man baggage of, spir of spiritual maturity, baggage in spiritual mature people can be dealt with out of Romans 12, 2, Ephesians 4, 20 through 24, 27 and 30. 
We tell you this over and over and over again. You need to study all that stuff. If you have any questions about that, why? Go see Al. He's the resident. He's the resident teacher on this subject. But kudos, kudos to old Jacob tonight. Kudos, because he he's going to be called Israel. And you, you know, I didn't I don't know that I wrote this down, but about somewhere over in about chapter 35. Somewhere over in about 35, God has to remind him, hey, when are you going to tell people I changed your name? You've been home, everybody's calling you Jacob. I'll call you Jacob. Next time you call up, don't say this is Jacob. I don't have any more Jacobs in my book. And he has to remind him in chapter 35 down in there somewhere. Listen, you've been letting everybody call you Jacob. That's not who you are, Bubba. Let me see you walk. That's my boy. That's my guy right there. Yeah. Yeah, that old boy with his limp. You know what his name is? Israel. So he lets him limp the rest of his life to remind him, your name's been changed, buddy. You're not the old man. You're the new man. I'm looking for the new man. He reminds him in 35, quit letting people tell you that. You still got a limp, buddy? Yeah. Um, let it ring a bell. Let that limp remind you who you are. You are not Jacob. You're Israel. Isn't that good? That's so good. God is good. He's good every day. Right, Horton? Well, close us out in a word of prayer. And Father, thank you for the promises. Give us for being so distracted oftentimes with what we feel and what we see instead of what we know. Mm. We all have battles, circumstances, struggles that no one else knows. There's no place for us to be judging each other. We need compassion, kindness. Father, this Friday, uh, Friday night at the gym, I've got a chance to talk to a bunch of young guys, and I pray that you bring those that are hungry, give me wisdom, be able to hit my target. I don't know these guys. Uh, thanks to John that uh, this door has opened and I look forward to it this Friday night. So give us some guns, people, and just get in on the blessing because God's going to do something. Mm. Because faithful, Lord, mm. you use anybody who's willing to trust you. Mm. Thank you for this teaching. Thank you for this truth. For those who come to this little room. Because they know this is what life is all about. Thank you for Jesus Christ and his faithfulness. In his name we pray. Mm.